name is Denise. I'll be your host today, and I'm really delighted to be joined by John, founder of Run the Chain, and Leslie, co-founder of Zen, who you've got a really gorgeous showcase here to discover as well. Our talk today is NFT Art 101, what you need to know. And we'll be going into what exactly is an NFT, what it's all about, and go deeper into what is NFT art. Our talk today is part of a new series of um, educational programming from K11, continuing their efforts to be at the forefront of innovation and creativity, part of their mission to democratize art, propagate culture, and incubate talent. Um, this talk will be part of a three talk series called NFT Art, The New Paradigm of Art and Culture where we will be talking to experts and specialists in the field of crypto and taking a deep dive into some of the trending discussions today. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to John, who's gonna take us through the fundamentals of NFT. Yeah, so I'm John, founder of Run The Chain. What we do is uh, in, uh, MarTech, which is marketing technology, news, education, SEO, production, content strategy. Um, this is all in the context of cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, again, our three brand pillars are MarTech, AI, education, community building. Uh, about myself and then about Jen, uh, we are artwork authentication platform. I'm an uh, accountant by training, um, but then I got into this um, art NFT world um, a few years ago. I have always been um, an art enthusiast, um, so I've been a collector and going into different museums and you know, working with different galleries. Um, so when I um, you know, came back to Hong Kong in 2009, and started to help company to go public in the US, um, so finance um, is my, uh, my thing. But then um, I joined this company, which is an online art uh, trading platform, uh, which I took them to um, NYSC to get listed. Uh, and then after that, I realized that there is a lot of pain points about the art world. Um, and then when the blockchain technology comes around, um, then we think that uh, blockchain is really able to solve a lot of pain points in the art market. And of course, today we are focusing on NFT, and NFT is just a tool that enable us to do a lot of things to solve the problems in the art world. So um, it's, NFT itself doesn't really have any value, um, but you know, the IP associated has. Thank you very much for K11, um, for you know, us to have the offline exhibition here so that we feel like we can have a more um, closer relationship with um, consumers and also the mass public uh, to promote um, what seems to be a black box in terms of cryptocurrency world and also with NFTs. But um, you know, we have been working with some of the leading um, artists in the world right now, Hajime Solayama, as we have um, displaying here, and also Javi Kayeha, Daniel Asham. Um, yeah, so let's just dive right into it. So how many of you guys here have heard of an NFT or know what an NFT is by a raise of hands? Uh, guys outside, inside, cool. And how many of you actually own an NFT? Okay, yeah, just to kind of gauge. Uh, okay, nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let me just start with the kind of fundamentals of what is an NFT. Uh, oh, yeah, so an NFT means something that is non-fungible, hence the name in a uh, non-fungible token means, uh, NFT means non-fungible token, right? So it can't be exchanged for something else. It's unique to itself. Fungible is something that can be an exchange. So for example, I have a $100 bill. I can exchange that one-to-one -one with another $100 bill and it's fungible, right? So you can trade it, it has the same value, but NFT effectively means that this is a unique item. It's a unique piece of whatever it is, whether that be art, ownership, something that is one and a, uh, unique to itself. Um, so uh, yes, so, and I think as part of that, it's important to understand that NFTs aren't necessarily a JPEG, right? It might be representing a JPEG, but this is just purely on-chain data that shows ownership. So what I mean by that is that um, if I have a token in my wallet that correlates with an NFT, that could also be pegged to um, you know, a car, a piece of art, a, um, you know, anything that you can imagine that is unique to itself. Um, so again, it can't be something that can copy or paste it. It's, it's unique. Um, yeah. And then so again, moving on to kind of what the main trend of things are is the NFT art side of things. Um, currently $1.2 billion in sales volume. These are just kind of some general prices for the top 10 pieces that have been sold as of June 2021. So as you can see, we go through this, it gets higher and higher um, to you know, single million dollar pieces for NFTs, all the way up to the tens of millions. 
And then if we get closer and closer to one, of course we have the Deepol for $69 million, which is really kind of the springboard for why everyone has heard of NFTs in the mainstream. Um, but I think it's important to note that, again, um, NFTs, the original standard, 721, is representation of ownership. With When we introduced uh, 1155, which is a new format for NFTs, it means that it's a fungible, non-fungible token. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean, it, you can have multiple copies of that NFT. You can have royalties that are distributed as part of that NFT. So say I'm a musician, I put out a, a song, someone buys that a song, but other people want to listen to it. When people listen to it, I get royalties from the people that are listening to it as part of the 1155, this new generation of N NFT formats. But I'd like to talk more on the, the kind of like applications and platforms. The most common one you guys have probably heard about is OpenSea. Now this is the kind of de facto NFT marketplace for buying um, ERC20. What I mean by that is, is uh, Ethereum based NFT tokens. Um, so they think this has the highest trading volume, um, this is where you can find a lot of the popular pieces, and this is kind of the most common um, assumption or representation of NFT platforms that people in the mainstream are familiar with. But it's relatively easy for you guys to actually start minting NFTs. Um, but I think that being said, it's also important to remember that um, the value of what you're minting isn't necessarily which platform or which currency you're using. It's about the IP um, that you're using to create it. The value that you assign, the value that we all agree upon that something has, whether that be a physical art piece or a digital art piece. I think it's about collectively a social contract for us saying, hey, there's value in that, that, is, that has beauty, that has creativity. Um, John, I'm gonna jump in. Yeah. If I am trying to choose, I want to mean my, my first NFT, let's say. How do I go about choosing a platform when there are so many? So I think it comes down to a number of variables. So first of all, um, how much do you expect to be selling the piece for? Um, and then that being said, if you want to sell it for a lot of money, then you probably want to go to the platform or the blockchain with the most liquidity. If you want to create something that has more utility, more use in, in what the, the smart contract you're writing, then I would probably default to something um, that the gas fees are lower, such as only one that's written on a blockchain called Solana. And com uh, you can compare Solana to Ethereum. Uh, Solana has 65,000 transactions per second. Ethereum only has 15 transactions per second. And that's kind of like the throughput of these blockchains, right? So if you want to do a lot with your application, your NFT, then you would want something like Solana versus 15 transactions per second because that bottleneck is a lot thicker. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so beyond that, I just wanted to kind of quickly touch base on different NFT applications outside of art. So digital content, so this is um, like art, the kind of collectibles, stuff that you guys see typically on OpenSea, Rarible, in-game in assets. So I think... This is something that is, um, has a high potential for the future of NFTs as far as like the short to midterm, um, especially with guys like Annie Mocha. They're one of the newest uh, unicorns in Asia. They're creating NFT in-game assets. So I think that we have yet to see this come to fruition. We have not seen a AAA rated game um, hit the market with NFT in-game assets that you can trade, um, such, such as like Fortnite. Once you buy your in-game assets in Fortnite, you're in this walled garden, you can never get it out. But the opportunity with NFTs is that once you buy these in-game in assets, you can stake them, you can rent them out, you can sell them for other in-game uh, in assets, right? So I think that uh, long-term, like uh, in-game assets, video games and NFTs, there's a high potential there. Domain names, so that's kind of like, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what a DNS is, uh, or ICANN, which is basically the, uh, what controls the internet? Who, who says which names go to which domains? Um, so there's an opportunity to use N NFTs as an ENS as opposed to a DNS, which is basically a decentralized version of ICANN, right? Because ICANN is still, there's what, seven keys controlled by 14 people. Um, if you get access to those keys, you can literally control the internet. Um, next, okay, investment and collateral. So there's, I mean, I, I think before getting into too much detail, there's an opportunity to where you can actually use NFTs in a multitude of ways, one in being like a kind of a virtual trust, right? You could put money or assets inside of that NFT that are released kind of like you would a trust, right? Once something uh, happens, like your kid turns 18, then the NFT releases the uh, funds. Stuff like this can actually be programmed into the NFTs themselves. Physical assets, um, this could be like a car, a house, a painting. Um, again, NFTs are just assigning ownership. So this could be physical, this could be digital, this could be anything that you can imagine. 
Um, yep. Okay, I'll pass it over. I introduced about what Jen is about. Um, so, you know, I'm going to focus on the art market uh, in terms of what NFT can do as an application of NFT. I would like to take a step back in terms of what blockchain is, right? So NFT is something on the blockchain, right? For layman like me, then I would think about what blockchain has to do uh, for my you know, artwork or for my collectibles, right? So blockchain is immutable. It is anonymous. Um, they have a lot of ways that you know, benefits the, um, the art market. But I think the core of it is um, you cannot change anything on the blockchain, right? So once you have something being written on the blockchain, um, you know, bear with my um, lemma language, then you cannot really change it. So that's the core of things. If there is only one thing you know, that you take away from the talk from me, um, I think you know, we really have to think about NFT as a tool versus NFT as an asset. I think this is a concept that we need to really ingrain in, our, in ourselves in terms of understanding what NFT is, right? Because essentially, if you have an NFT that without the underlying assets or underlying IPs to go with it, then it's nothing. I mean, it's just a tool at the end of the day. It's just a token on, on the blockchain, right? So John mentioned about, um, you know, NFT can tie to, you know, physical objects. It can tie to digital um, objects. So I, I, I will let you, you know, to try to imagine, you know, you, you have used computer before, you know, you have JPEG, you have animation, you know, you send around JPEG. Right now you have WhatsApp. I take the photos um, in a concert, then I shared it with my friends. So in the traditional sense, a digital asset is something that you can share over and over again. Then it suddenly comes with an idea of non-fungible token, meaning that you can really put a fence on something that, you know, traditionally you think that, oh, I can pass around all the time and there's no true ownership to it because I have the photo in my phone, you have the photo in your phone, so who actually owns it, right? So I think that is the core of why NFT becomes so popular, meaning that oh, all of a sudden we have a blockchain-powered uh, fans that I can say, this JPEG, I own it. And then I can say, okay, I am a creator of a um, artwork, uh, this JPEG, I take a picture, and I can say that there's only five additions to it. And an NFT becomes a tool that I can use to say, okay, there's only five additions in the whole world. Because I created, I mint a token. Well, literally you mint a token, but then, you know, the point is you have the NFT that you can claim the ownership of it. So in Gen, um, what we, you know, really believe in is to reimagine the ownership. Meaning that, okay, what does it mean by actually owning a thing? Right? So if you process, uh, if you have a uh, physical work here, does it mean that you really truly own it? So we believe that digital ownership in the future is really important, meaning that, okay, on top of you have a physical product or artwork in front of you, you also need to register your digital ownership on blockchain. Why on blockchain? Again, it's because it's immutable, it's because you cannot change anything so that people trust the system. So once you register the ownership of this particular product, you know that this is, this is, this is mine until at the point that you, you, know, you transfer ownership, right? So the whole idea of we imagine ownership is at the core of what we do and using blockchain in particular. Basically what uh, we do, we start with is we start with physical products. So, you know, I had this idea a few years ago and then, you know, I started this company in 2009, 2019. And then back then, it was a really hard time for me to tell people what we do because um, basically we're talking about NFT, these three letters, and no one knows about what these three letters mean. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, at the beginning of this year, the few months of NFT craze, and everyone knows about NFTs. But, you know, we still need to educate everyone to know what uh, NFT is about. So essentially what we started with is, for example, um, this is what uh, we have done before. So this is a collectibles, um, you know, by Hajime Sawayama, a legendary um, Japanese artist. Um, and then what we do with it is uh, we embed the NFC chip inside. NFC is nothing, you know, fancy, right? And the reason why we use NFC is because everyone has MS NFC on the phone. So if you're an NFC function of it, we embed the chip inside through our mobile app, then you can scan the products to authenticate this product. But we don't stop there, right? So the whole idea is you need to claim the digital ownership of it as well. So, you know, when you purchase this artwork, then you scan for authenticity, then you register your digital ownership on the blockchain. 
So every single collectibles that you buy, we create an NFT for you. And that NFT becomes a digital certif certificate of authenticity, meaning that it becomes a digital provenance to record all the digital ownership down you know, all the way from A buying it, selling to B, B selling to C, and C selling to D, right? So ultimately, what we want to promote is, okay, even though if you go to Christie and sell this B and sell this product in the future, if you don't have the digital ownership that goes with it, then you know, it doesn't mean you actually own this product. And we really believe in this um, you know, new uh, era of um, blockchain technology. And also, uh, I think John can talk about more about Metaverse and you know, Decentraland, you know, all this kind of fun stuff. You know, we are really blending the physical world and also the digital world, right? And then in Agen, we continue to, uh, to push forward. When you say embedding uh, a chip into the artwork, yeah. therefore authenticating it, mm -hmm. so does, the, does that only work with during production of the artwork, or can you do it to pre-existing works? Yes, um, that is a really good question. You know, for all the new products that we do, then we can embed the chip inside. But we have also projects with uh, artists, existing artists right now, who wants to um, authenticate or use the gen technology to authenticate all the work that he has created. Of course, you have to chase down your collectors that you know they have been, um, you know, purchased the work before. But that is something that he believes in because. He doesn't want his work to be flowing out there and then without the authentication and digital provenance of it. He sees the future of the digital ownership of it. So he, he, that's why he wants to do that. I think um, all of these is uh, a tool. To further explain what we do is, um, you know, as I said, you, one type of authentication is very user-friendly, intuitive frictionless. And then, um, as we all know, provenance is, in the art world, is a really, really big problem. And that's why when I you know, started this company, um, it actually didn't take me a long time to persuade some of the top galleries and artists to use our, use our technology because they see the pain point. IP is very intangible, right? So if you don't have protections of IP, then it doesn't worth anything. It can destroy the whole market, right? So, you know, for example, Hajime Sawayama work in China uh, or around the world, um, they're starting to ha have a lot of fake products uh, with it. So, you know, with this technology, you can say, okay, this is truly authentic. Even the NFC chip, you can replicate it, you can copy it, but then registering your ownership of the products on blockchain is something that you cannot, you cannot change. So, briefly talk about the market. You know, Ethereum is uh, one of the chain uh, that, um, um, you know, for NFT, um, ELC721 or ELC1115, that John has been talking about is all based on uh, Ethereum. But we also see other um, NFT market they're using uh, Flow, for example, like NBA Top Shot is another application that we see NFT is really, really hot. Uh, NFT Top Shot is about um, you know, the NBA key moments and uh, registering the digital ownership of owning that particular you know, uh, key moment of, uh, of NBA, right? But then um, Ethereum, of course, uh, has doubled in value, and you know, even though it's very fluctuating, uh, but in general, it has doubled in value. Um, you know, the e uh, ETH-based token is the next asset class that we think is, is really hot in the market. And then the NFT sales has grown over 2,000%. Um, you know, the first year, as um, John mentioned, about well, um, over 1 billion, 2 billion um, sales already. So uh, for the first half of the, of the year, it's, uh, it's really uh, hot. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to uh, really thank um, K11 again, um, because our mission is to educate uh, also with uh, what digital ownership is about. Uh, we believe this is really important, and we need partners um, to really educate this uh, to the world. Um, so having a physical exhibition like this, having a talk, uh, thank you, Denise, to host. Um, all of this stuff is really important for us to uh, tell uh, the world how, why, why digital ownership is really important, right? Um, and then all along, uh, we started with a physical product, and this particular, particular uh, exhibition, we are going to launch the first NFT uh, for Solayama uh, Sensei. Um, you know, why we pick Solayama, right? So Solayama has been very um, futuristic, um, and his uh, creative style is about, you know, robot. Uh, he is the creator of the Sony dog, if you still remember that, you know, the first robot pet. Um, and he believes in this. Uh, he believes in digital ownership. And we are also working on an um, eternal project uh, with, uh, with Solema uh, that will bring his work to you know, eternity forever, right? 
Um, so all along, we are having a tools of NFT to authenticate the product. And at the same time, we also have augmented reality AR experience uh, in our app. Um, that can be part of the NFT as well. So imagine you have an NFT that you actually owns limited editions of the AR experience of, of a product or in an exhibition. So um, we will continue to work with K11 to, um, to evolve, um, to have the journey of um, from a physical world to a digital world and blending the two together using all the tools with NFT, AR, and you know, different apps, aspect of things to uh, make things happen. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. That was extremely insightful. Now, I don't know about everybody else here, but I've been spending a lot of time trying to get my head around what exactly NFT art this term really is, especially when we're often talking about there's artworks and there's collectibles. So I want to put a question out there for both of you. What really separates an artwork from a collectible, but also at what point do they cross over? I, so. think, I, I think you don't have to choose between the two, right? There can be some collectibles that are also art, right? Um, but I think that there are pure collectibles as well. And a lot of the context of these high value collect collectibles isn't necessarily that um, they bought it because it's art, they bought it because they wanted access to a community, right? So for example, if you buy a Bored Ape NFT, this gives you access to their Discord channel. If you have access to their Discord channel, you find out what they're investing in next. And that ends up being um, you know, alpha for your next trades, right? If you get into the next NFT before everyone else does, you make money on that. So, but I, that shouldn't say that you can't have a collectible, i.e. a series of say 10,000 um, pieces of work that aren't also art, right? It, it's kind of like, how some people view you know, high value Pokemon cards as art as well, right? Because it's nostalgic, it resonates with them. They perceive it as being valuable to them. They perceive it as art um, because it's nostalgic. So I think that the two aren't inseparable, but there are some sincere pieces that are like, this is um, you know, digital native. There's only one of these. This was made as art um, and it's not necessarily a collectible because it it's, was created in its native format as digital and there's only one of it, right? I think, yeah. Yeah, I can agree more about that. And um, I think um, the, the act of collecting is at the core of why NFT is at the forefront of everything. And um, the value is absolutely driven by um, a lot of different factors. But you know, if we look at different kind of NFT projects, um, you know, John introduced uh, some of them, um, but you know, CryptoPunk is uh, one of the most OG of the you know, uh, NFT project. Um, then people will start to scratch their heads about uh, what is the artistic value with CryptoPunk? Why CryptoPunk worth as much as other people perceive? Right, you're one of those, right? So I think, I think one thing important to understand is, okay, CryptoPunk may represent NFT itself because it's kind of like one of the you know, hottest and one of the earliest project with um, you know, the NFT applications. And um, I think people owning CryptoPunk, just my personal opinion, right? John, you may have different opinion, but people own this uh, representing this is the beginning of something very big, right? NFT, everyone believes it's very big. It's a tool, but then, you know, it can be signaling a new internet, right? Something, something as, you know, significant as that, right? So that's why CryptoPunk, may, maybe that's why it's worth a lot. But then in general, you see other projects like, Crypto Kitties, um, like um, com those are what I, I would put it as a community project, meaning that it may not have a lot of artistic value associated with it, but then it, they create a community with it. On the other side of things, you have um, you know Daniel Ashram issuing a launching an NFT, which is you know purely artistic point of view. So traditional artist who has um, sold uh, artwork in galleries. Um, that be perceived as having artistic value and you know, foray into the NFT world as well. So, um, And then another question I had was, there's a lot of discussion around that NFTs can help make art more democratic. Because of course, traditionally, we always say artists are on the losing end. Once they sell their artwork, the money doesn't go to them. But does NFT actually make art more democratic? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. From the perspective of more accessibility, um, I suppose it depends on the kind of launch that they're doing because sometimes they can have kind of 
exclusivity built into the launch, right? They might do an NFT launch to where you have to be whitelisted. You have to pass some sort of, um, you know, approval process to get in. So there is, in that regard, I think it's, it really comes down to the, the platform, really comes down to um, what the, you can have more democratic platforms, you can have more democratic uh, royalties, but it really depends on who wrote the smart contract, who developed the platform, right? Garbage in, garbage out. If you have really good raw materials, really good ideas going in, then the end product will typically be better, right? Versus like someone who's like, hey, I want to make this exclusive. Uh, I want to make this something that's like not, right? So it really, it comes down to the creator of the platform. But I think that more so than anywhere else in the uh, arts or even music space, you have the ability to give the artist power in regards to royalty, right? Um, especially in the music industry, you have your, um, you know, managers, you have record labels, you have, you know, the studio, you have your artist relations guys. So there's so many different people who get a cut of your royalties before you actually see it. And you don't have visibility of any of that. And I think the same thing, similar things apply to art, maybe not as bad as with the music industry. But in this case, it's not just about, um, you know, the, the one time you sell that piece, you know, you no longer benefit from it. Because sometimes you sell that piece and then someone makes a replica or puts it on a t-shirt and they make exponentially more from the collectible side, right? So in this case, what you can give the artist the ability to do is say, hey, I want an 11.55 NFT to where every time this is resold, I get part of the royalties. I get part of the uh, proceeds, no matter how many times it's traded, because ultimately I'm the one who created the piece. So I think that in that regard, yes, it can be more democratic. And then you can have more visibility. It's all on-chain data. That means you can put the smart contract into Etherscan and see exactly what's going on. Um, so in that regard, you have more visibility. It's more transparent, but it really comes down to how you structure the smart contracts. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, be too philosophical about how to define, um, you know, democratizing art. But uh, from a very traditional sense, democrat, democratizing art means um, you make it more accessible to more people, right? And then at the same time, to be more transparent. Right? And then maybe uh, decrease the barrier of entry into the art market. Because if you look at you know, some of the you know, really hot art uh, work, you're talking about Monet, you're talking about Picasso, then your entry point is like tens of millions of dollars, right? And who has a lot of tens of millions of dollars to invest in one asset class, right? So you know, in, in the blockchain world, um, people start to think about or securitizing it. So breaking down the ownership of a Picasso work into millions of ownership, meaning that you can decrease your barrier of entry and own a piece of ownership of the artwork. So that is one application that we see. I think uh, democ democratizing art means make it more accessible to more people. And that's exactly what we are trying to do here. Uh, with K11, we you know, have a collaboration because uh, we want to be closer. Uh, to people, you guys can touch it, right? So that's why we started to do a lot of additions. So um, instead of like unique work, only 20 people can own it, um, you know, we have addition 1,000 so that more people can have it. And then to a sense that, you know, we are launching an NFT at a, at a higher addition number so that more people can own an NFT per se. Um, so that's the journey that we are trying to push through is to democratize on. Um, I've got plenty more questions, but I am aware of the time. So I'd love to thank John and Leslie for their time and sharing. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Our next talk will be in October. So if you enjoyed today, please hang tight and we'll be releasing the details soon. The next talk will be going into details of um, collecting and exhibiting NFT and NFT art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.